chapter 13. When we get done reading, I need you to keep it open. We're going to come back to the story later. I've got more reading to do. Look at 1 Kings chapter 13, starting at verse 1. Any time. I think I started too early during the Sunday school lesson. Didn't give Roger time. I wanted to make sure he has time. Well, I think this is one of the more interesting stories in the Bible, but I don't know, it always catches my attention and all. Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Jeroboam is the king, and he's burning incense at an altar that God did not ordain. He's burning incense to the false idols. And this man of God stays nameless the whole story. Verse 2 says, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt up upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. So you understand that he, he spoke against the king and knew what he was doing. And he's saying another person will come up, he'll take your throne, and he's going to sacrifice these priests. He's going to kill them, and they'll be the sacrifice. In verse 4, And it came to pass when... Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand be, may be restored to me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. I want to preach to you this morning the cost of our decisions. The cost of our decisions. Let's pray one more time. Lord, we, I, I thank you. I felt your spirit in the worship, Lord. I need you to minister, Lord. Anoint it. Help me explain what the burden you put on my heart, God. Help me deliver it, Jesus. Lord, in your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Again, keep your Bible open to that spot. Because we'll come back to it here in a little bit and read the rest of that chapter, or at least more of that chapter. I want to remind you to an event in history that I was particularly close to. October 12th, the year 2000. I was sitting watch inside the EW module of the USS George Washington. We were doing our Persian Gulf cruise. I don't remember 
remember exactly where we were at in the water. It's probably in the Persian Gulf at that point, considering what's about to happen. I was sitting watching the low man on the total pole. Had our headphones on in one ear. I could hear the other ships of the battle group in the other ear. I could hear the other modules in our in our department. And I remember hearing in this ear someone tell the, the tactical action officer there's been an explosion on the USS Cole. And the Cole was a destroyer in our battle group. We were the, the battle group commander, but they were in our battle group. What had happened was the destroyer needed fuel. And of all places, if they decided to get fuel, it was the country of Yemen. Y-E-M-E-N. Faith, was your hand up? Okay. I thought you may have been there. I thought that was going to give me perspective. And the, while they were at port in Yemen getting fuel, a suicide bomber in a Zodiac raft was able to come up in his raft right through the hull of the ship and exploded. A destroyer is not a big ship. Um, it, it's larger than a frigate, but it's smaller than a cruiser. It made a drastic size hole, killing 37. No, killed 17 right on the spot and 37 more throughout the, the event. They only had a crew of about 100. 17, as high as numbers is by itself, is drastically more when it's a good chunk of your crew. And the rest of the day, they had to fight fires, they had to close doors, because that's the, the key to firefighting on a ship in a hole is you start every 6 feet, 12 feet is another hatch, and it's either going to be waterproof or airproof, depending on where it's at. So they were locking the doors, containing the damage. And they finally put it out. They finally hauled the ship off, repaired her, and she's back in float today. A few years after that, I was attending a training in Damnet, Virginia. And damage control state officer first class, I won't say his name, was teaching it. And it turns out he was in charge of the damage control division of the coal on the day of the attack. And he tells a very interesting perspective of it. He talks about how good their damage control team was. They were award winning, they were phenomenal. They blew the perfect scores on audits. And they were really good, and he was proud of it. He worked hard. The problem is, and he'll tell you this with tears in his eyes, the problem is he only focused on the main part of the damage control team. Think of it as first and second and third string of a sports team, if you will. The first team, the first string was awesome. They were great. He forgot he had a second string. Because what are the odds of a, bo of a bomb coming up right beside the hole? What are the odds that when it explodes, it explodes just on the other side of the birthing where his crew slept. What are the odds that bomb would take out every one of his first string damage control technicians? He had spent all of his time and effort preparing these men for such an occasion, and they're the ones that were taken out, and now he's left with the people that he had neglected. More people died that day than needed to because they weren't prepared. He tells that story in an attempt to tell us to prepare everyone. He, he now champions, and I'm sure by now at this point he's out of the Navy, okay? But he spent the rest of his career trying to tell everyone to train everybody, prepare everybody because he don't know who's going to be taken out. And he was haunted by that. What I want to talk to you today about is the cost of decision. The cost of his decision to not train everyone. There were people who were against the fight that they were not prepared for. 
They didn't understand the mechanics of what. Now, every sailor from boot camp to every training, we have a, a general idea of firefighting, okay? That, that's just mandatory because you're on this metal can and the fire is one of the worst things that can happen to you. But they, they were not advanced in their training. All they knew how to do was to lock a door and run a, a fire extinguisher. But at the extent of the damage here, you needed more experience, and they didn't have it. The decision that he made to only focus on certain people was not malice. He wasn't evil. If the bombing had never happened, you wouldn't even know that he was inadequate. Because on paper, they looked like all-stars. On paper, he was the best supervisor that damage control had ever seen. But the explosion revealed the truth. Let's talk about the decision to not engage that rat. I remember on my ship, sitting outside Palma, Spain, a month after the coal was bombed, they allowed Greenpeace, and I'm not allowed to describe Greenpeace to you because I don't have good adjectives for them, and I'm being recorded. <laughs> they allowed Greenpeace to get in their boat, their little, it was a not a wreck, but a little boat, just a little bigger than a bass boat, and they allowed them to get under our anchor. See, Greenpeace was, was not happy with us because we have two nuclear reactors and they're anti-nuclear. And they felt that if they could get under our anchor, that we wouldn't be able to anchor. And therefore we would go somewhere else. And the commander had no <laughs> desire to start an international incident. He was willing to risk that these were not terrorists. It, it, he got lucky. And they were not. And there were no explosions. He got lucky that we are the United States of America. Because I can show you videos of another country where they tried that and they went in and dropped the anchor on top of their boat. The United States of America has the public national stance of you, you hit us first and we retaliate. So they were wet. So, man, I just think about that. They were willing to risk lives. It was a bad day for me. Okay. It still brings back emotions and anger. What about the decision for the coal to receive fuel in an aggressive country? That's Yemen. Would you, you may not know the history, but that is quite equivalent to pull up to Iraq and say, hi! It's one of those countries. How bad do they need fuel? We can refuel at sea. I don't know the politics that went involved in that decision, but look at the effect of it. Look at the cost of that decision. None of these decisions were evil. They were somebody having to make a decision and it made and it turned out bad. What inspired this message today is that I'm still dealing with students from Job Corps, and some of them have the, the most heartbreaking stories, but there's nothing I can do to help them. They put themselves in that situation yeah. with bad decisions, but they never said here's to being desperate and homeless. No, 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 that wasn't the motivation of their decision. It was multiple. They wanted to fit in. They were sad. They didn't think it would hurt them. Whatever the reason of their first decision was, it had an ultimate price that they're still paying for today. And I'll be honest. I don't know if they will ever get their lives right. The odds are that much against them. Without somebody coming in and just taking over for them. There is such a deep hole financially, and they don't have the education to get a job, and because of their finances, they can't go get it. It's just a horrible cycle that is the cost of their decision. 
As a pastor, I see people doing it. And as a youth pastor, I tell the kids the number one thing that I said to them from the moment I started till today is be careful who you hang out with. But don't you know they don't listen to me? Don't you know they think they're smarter than that? Oh, you don't understand, Brother Yates. I love so-and-so. And yet that so-and-so ruins their lives. Amen. And the next thing you know, they're in their 20s or in their 30s. Ruined. Paying the cost of their decision. And, and your heart hurts you, but you can't even tell them, I told you so. You don't want to say, I told you so. All you want to do is cry with them. It didn't have to be this way. You, you didn't have to make those decisions. Why didn't you listen to the preacher? Why didn't you listen to better judgment? Because we never think about that at the moment. The devil's crafty. Life is crafty. But adults don't 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 sit there and amen and, and it's not like the kids. Same thing happens here. I tell you, don't miss church. I tell you the church is vile. And there and yet I see it not I'm not speaking to the Pentecostals of the wit. I'm talking things I'm seeing in general. And have seen in general. Right now, in this year 2020, I tell you what, COVID knocked us for a loop. Nobody saw it coming, at least here. We didn't expect it to have this kind of effect. Nobody knew the politics that would be involved and everything. And yet, because of this fear of a disease that has 98% survival rate, there are people that are selling out their souls, trying to protect a temporary body. They're worried about a few more years on this temporary earth. And they don't even see the cost of their decision on their eternal soul. And I, I'm, man, I'm, I'm trying to word this just right where it doesn't hurt. But we would rather go to hell without COVID than, to get, than risk getting COVID and still maintaining our heaven. So it's not just COVID that does it. It's Whatever the call explosion is in your life, it knocks you for a loop. It shows what you are. You know, the storm never does make the man, it reveals the man. Amen. The circumstances don't make you salty. It just reveals how salty you already are. And by salt, kids, I'm not talking about angry. I'm thinking of a Navy term. How ready you are, how experienced you are. These, these altar calls are life-changing moments. Amen. Let's go back to that story. I'm going to pick up at verse 11, 1 Kings 13 and 11. So here, the man of God delivered his message, rebuked the king, his hand drew up, he had enough faith that he prayed and hands was restored. The king offered him rewards, and he said, no, because I have my orders. Verse 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the work that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken to the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said to them, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came, came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me, and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water from thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And, then, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring, back, bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. 
So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drink water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came back unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten and bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulchre of thy fathers. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. Man, that story just blows my mind. Don't you know your biggest obstacle is not going to be the boogeyman? <laughs> he saw the king coming a mile away. He said, nope, I ain't falling for it. But he let an old man who said he was a prophet convince him that what he had always been taught was wrong. Be careful if somebody tells you you can do what the God has told you you can't do. There's a cost for your decision. The young man paid the price for his decision. I want to illustrate something. I need two volunteers. I'm going to ask for Daniel and Olivia to volunteer. Yes, it is. I need you to start that way, casually walk, and make laps around the circle. Daniel, you are giving her a head start. I don't want you to do the same thing, and I don't want you to stop until I tell you to, okay? So, slowly, don't catch up to it. So you see, God gives orders, and we're all about our path, doing what we're supposed to do, making our way. God tells you to go to church. God tells you to have a burden. God tells you to reach out. God tells you to pray. Olivia, what's on that altar right now? So you see what happened is I distracted you long Daniel, stop. I distracted you long enough. And what you don't know is that, that Satan is like a roaring lion who is always roaming and doesn't stop. Y'all going to be seated. The lion didn't catch the young man, but he caught up to the young man. When God told him, don't stop, it was because the enemy was behind him. And when he got distracted doing what he shouldn't be doing, the cost of the decision was that lion was there and now on his path. Amen. Does that make sense this morning? Yep. Don't let the media tell you the church is not essential. Don't let family tell you that they're more important. There is nothing more important than living for God. There is nothing more important than your prayer life with God. I don't care what it costs you. It may cost you your family. It may cost you your job. Whatever the situation is, you better not let go of God and his word. You better hang on because the cost of your decisions will catch up to you. You will reap what you saw. Sister Yates, we never know the weight of our decisions. We never know the impact that it's going to have. What year is this? 2020. In 1998, I made a decision to hang out and spend the night in a hotel room with a friend. Just hanging out. He wasn't even a friend. He was an acquaintance, but he was the friend of my friend. You hear me? He was the friend of my friend. And my friend, who I thought was going to hang out with us and spend the night with us, did not. He went home. And now I'm stuck in this hotel room with this guy that I used to know from school, but he had moved to Texas. 
we weren't buddies then. It's kind of awkward, but we're getting along. And he pulls out the phone book. He hadn't been in Arkansas in some years. And he's calling people that he used to know. I'm telling you to talk to our decisions here. He look, he finds one number. Never mind the fact that it's now two or three o'clock in the morning and he's still calling people. Adults know that's stupid. But to a 16, 17 year old, eh, let's see what happens. And he got a hold of a parent. <laughs> and he tossed me the phone. And now I explain to this parent that we're just stupid 16 year olds and we were trying to reach so and so. Well, she cussed me out, told me what she thought of me. We hung up, and then that girl called back. And we started talking to that girl. The next day, I talked to her, and she goes, I have a friend on the phone who wants to talk to you. Her name is Miranda. <laughs> we never know the impact. We never know the weight of our decisions. I cannot imagine what my life would be like without Miranda. I know that I prayed for a different life before that opportunity. Before I met Miranda, there, were, there was someone else that I thought was who God wanted me to have. And I prayed for that. Now, God can do different things. Okay? I don't believe God is bound by one plan. And if that plan doesn't work out, then he's just up a tree. However, if I had not been with Miranda and I'd been with someone else, I probably would have still had kids, but it wouldn't have been these kids. You see, there, there, there's a cost to our decisions. That's not always bad. But every decision we make turns into another decision. And I'm asking you today to decide. To make a decision today that may just possibly have everlasting effects. It can have the USS Cole effect, or it can have the life-changing, beautiful effect. These altar calls that I'm given are these opportunities. You decide how serious you are with God. You decide what kind of prayer. Uh, now I lay me down to sleep, kind of just enough to get it over with, kind of prayer. Or a wholehearted God, you know my heart. Renew my spirit, Lord. God, it's been too long since I prayed for the Holy Ghost. Lord, it's been too long since I've actually felt the desire in my heart. You have to decide. I'm asking us to find a place to pray right now. Choose Jesus.